Hi, Victoria. How are you? Good morning, Katarina. I'm well. How are you doing? Really good. I had a good morning today. I'm <laughs> working from oh, home. Fantastic. Yeah. That's the best. I could sleep a little bit more. I had migraines the, the last few days and they are gone now. <laughs> no, I am having a good morning. Thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. May they always be gone. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Hi, Brian. How are you? Thanks for coming. Hi, Diego. Hi, Catherine. Good morning, Brian. Welcome. Good morning, Diego, Catherine, Ravi. Goodbye, Ravi. Welcome, Ravi. Ravi's having issues. Do you like the as the topics wheel of time? Do you think that's appropriate? I'm not sure. There's no time crystal. I love that. <laughs> Wait, we all have time. Yeah. That's great. Why does engineering have a pizza? Because engineers eat pizza? I don't know. <laughs> it's so weird, isn't it? Because you have to figure out where to put the the things. <laughs> the topics. <laughs> it's a, I I think I asked somebody already, but nobody knows. Maybe there's a, we need to Google, there might be a famous joke about engineers and pizza, like how many engineers does it take to make a pizza? We just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Good, totally. Hello, this is Raghav Sharma from India. Hi, how are you today? I'm good, I'm good. Um, we will talk today about... Um, physics and time crystals. So we are waiting for our guest speaker for a few minutes. Um, okay, so but I'm a, will... I'm a magician and a fashion photographer. So I think... Oh, you should have come yesterday uh, when we had the room about um, using gold and DNA, like using tiny gold particles and DNA in a gel to change colors uh, uh, because we talked about um, how we could maybe in the future make like the skin patches that change color or textiles or clothes um, in a very cool way. Um, that would have been interesting for you probably. But yeah, feel free to learn today about time crystals. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Katerina, for inviting me. Uh, do follow me back. Uh, I'll, I'm going to follow you guys. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, and Brian, that's a good that's a good answer because of the triangle. That's a, because it's an interesting um, you know, with interesting angles. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, That's a good, good answer. So, what are you guys doing for a living? Like, I'm a scientist. Um, I'm a senior scientist um, at the company and assistant professor at NYU. Uh, and yeah, Victoria, <laughs> you answer for yourself. Hi. I Amazing. work in our oh, Go ahead. You were, you were speaking? Loads of expect for you guys, Katerina and Victoria. You are the future for our Earth. Well, thank you. That's very kind. So what type of photography do you do? Oh, fashion photography. I do fashion photography and I do uh, music videos as well. I'm a DOP. Okay, interesting. I'm in this uh, field like uh, for uh, eight years, and I'm 22 year old. So I do fashion photography or photography from my childhood, like from 11, 12. Oh wow! Yeah, my son he's a music producer. My first son, and about your age, 
and he also makes music uh, videos. So interesting. You guys should connect. My, my, my son is here in New York City having a studio and uh, making uh, music videos too. So that's interesting. <laughs> okay, okay. And he always criticizes me how I dress. Like he is <laughs> he's so good at um, matching styles and colors. And I'm the typical, well, not typical, but a little bit more the, the nerd that doesn't have patience every day to care about um, how I dress. So. <laughs> That's yep, really yep. fun. That he's, uh, he's, I hope he's more critique and less like criticism. Yeah. Like he gives, I hope it's ideas. Hey, good morning, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Yes, both hey, my good. sons are. And my daughter is very good at that too. She actually dresses her on her, like she makes her own dresses now sometimes. So my kids are very stylish, um, and yeah, they the sneakers, for example, they choose. Do them tell me their, they their names. <laughs> Do tell me their uh, username. Do tell me their username in comment box. Oh yeah, I will. I will. I have to. <clears throat> I have to check them. Well, my my middle son and my daughter, they are younger. My daughter, she's eight. She will turn nine, and my middle son, he's twelve. But they are very good at choosing, you know, styles and stuff. Like my daughter gets compliments all the time about her, you know, clothes and I never, <laughs> but I get compliments since they choose my shoes. I get compliments from my, from my shoes now, from my sneakers, from various colleagues that are younger than me. <laughs> Uh, if you keep talking about your sneakers, Evening, we're going to need some PTR. Hello. Good morning, Jamie. Hey, Victoria, how are you? Yeah, hey, how are you? We are having a very non-scientific discussion about styles and fashion because we had the fashion photographer from India here talking with us, passing the time. <laughs> I thought we were prepping for a photo shoot, honestly. <laughs> Sorry about that, I was switching my uh, Wi-Fi over. That was quite a bad connection. Can everybody hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah, Ryan, that's good that you've chosen that shirt for today's talk, considering we had the fashion photographer here. I'm glad that you're making such um, wise decisions. Um, sorry, uh, Jamie Ryan is wearing a powder blue button down shirt, recently pressed. Hi, Sam. Um, um, I invite, oh, there you are. Welcome, the, uh, meet our team. Um, uh, meet Jamie. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hello. Welcome. Very good. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I guess it's morning over there. Oh, good day. Hello. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in Scotland, so we're in the, we're in the same time zone at least. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Jamie, I'm Jamie. Where are you? I'm I'm in uh, actually at home today in Lancaster, which is uh, oh, nice. which is close to Manchester. Yeah. Pretty. Is it pretty warm over there just now? It's been decently warm here, but I heard that um, over there where you are just now is pretty warm. Well, you know, Lancaster is right at the coast, so it's never very cold. It's never very hot. It's almost always raining. Uh, <laughs> nice. Um, but. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I haven't been out in in the past four hours or so, but that's at 12. It wasn't very warm, maybe 18 or something like that. Ah. But it's a working day, so it doesn't really make any difference. 
Absolutely not. Anyway, you're about to talk about some very high-minded science. That's where our minds are going to travel. They're going to go out beyond what we know, and that's as much as out as we can expect. Yes. We already commented that uh, your bio has the has the coolest questions in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <clears throat> um, <laughs> it's a, it's an advertising business, if you wish. I mean, I don't like that, but, but that's the way it works. Like when you when you um, trying to get your stuff through in in fashionable journals, or especially if you're applying for Anglo American. Uh, fellowships then then uh, you know uh, cool stuff is what you need um, and while that is, isn't necessarily always the most efficient way of describing what the research is about it, it, it makes uh, people interested so that's uh, that's a necessity oh katarina was this with the question that you put on the the chat with us so can you melt a time crystal or something yes. is it you said <laughs> yes <laughs> ah, ah you know um Dr. Um, Katarina had put this question out yesterday and I just thought she was randomly asking it herself. And I didn't actually know this was part of no, uh, I didn't. Uh, what I you had on there. Check out the bio, like I shared the bio and then I, I, ah, okay. I pointed I never, out I never, the question. <laughs> okay, that, that makes sense now uh, because that was an incredibly cool question. Um, can you melt one of these things? <laughs> yeah, well, so uh, of course it's... Um, uh, a nice way of, of, of asking things, but but uh, it turns out it also mathematically makes sense, and I will talk about that in a in a moment. But, mm. but uh, so um, well, originally uh, time crystals came about um, as an outcome of a mathematical adventure, if you like. Um, uh, well, Frank Wilczek basically was asking whether whether the concept of um, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking can be applied to the, the, the time domain, just like it is applied to many other domains like space and, and various other things in phase transitions. Well, I will explain what all that means, but, but if you follow this logic, uh, <clears throat> then, um, then it makes also sense to ask uh, um, what it means and whether it is possible to, to melt a time crystal, which basically means whether you can remove the the uh, synchronous aspect of this this motion that characterizes the phase. That sounds really interesting. Hey. And it's amazing that you're wetting our appetite before the the big event even. Yeah. You really are <laughs> becoming a showman. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. With that <laughs> we should start. Uh, because we can't wait to hear what's going on, like, um, you know, what else you have to share. So uh, welcome everyone to the Science Society today. Um, uh, thank you everyone for coming and uh, special thanks here to Sam. Um, and uh, before we start, uh, let me give you a little bit of uh, information about our guest speaker, Dr. Sam Otti. Um, Dr. Sam Otti um, is a lecturer um, and EPSRC fellow at Lancaster University in the UK. He completed his PhD in low temperature laboratory in Finland and uh, he was working on superfluid helium-3. Uh, Sam was, um, he received in 2020 the IUPAP Young Scientist Prize for a range of superfluid discoveries he made. And currently uh, he works uh, with the interfaces between classical and quantum physics. And he really would like to answer questions such as, what does it feel like to touch a quantum fluid? And can we melt a time crystal? And whether the out outcome is a time liquid? If those are not the coolest questions in the world, I don't know. <laughs> For me, they are. And uh, before we start uh, with your presentation, Victoria would like to ask you a couple of questions. 
and then the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Katarina. So, um, Sam, welcome to Science Society. And <laughs> those questions are so fascinating. They're, the visuals that they evoke are just, that's really fun to spend some time considering those questions. So my question to you is to carry us into your research and give us a little bit of a background to your background in science, but um, not academic, rather, what is your, your um, if you look back through your life, what would be your unique connection to science, meaning a point at which you felt, um, you felt an affinity for for sciences in general, and that could be some time in your, you know, in your youth and play, or some time in your education. So that is my question to you. <clears throat> all right. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. First of all, um, as to my um, inspiration for scientific life, um, well, I mean, I've I've always been interested in learning about just about everything that I can learn about. I mean, I've been reading books about not only physics and chemistry and mathematics, but also philosophy and biology and politics and all that, pretty much as, far, as, as long as I can remember. Uh, and then if you, if you talk to my parents, I guess they, they could list certain like um, early signs, such as um, uh, when we went to visit uh, some family friends, uh, I would uh, I would normally go like as the first thing I would go to uh, the kitchen to uh, to like um, open the doors which are lead uh, lead to the space under the kitchen sink to to see what kind of pipe work there was or, or something like this so um, so uh, I guess this kind of like um, technical approach to things is uh, is very natural to me. Um, well, maybe I could I could also share a story about how how I became a superfood scientist instead of something else. So this was uh, I was I was a student in what is now known as Alta University, but was actually Helsinki University of Technology at the time. And so there you apply for summer positions in research groups um, during your first or second um, summer, <clears throat> and and I did that as well. And then um, in the end, I was choosing between two groups in the Lotem lab, um, and both of them were working on superfluids, and I didn't understand anything about that. But I had just had this gut feeling that one of them was was like very dynamic and interesting, and the other one was was somehow not. And I only later I learned that the the other one had some some like major. Uh, had had some major setbacks in their projects, and and so I selected the one which happened to be successful without really knowing why. Um. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm I'm writing this down because it's it's really, um, you know, every answer is so unique, and and both parts of both parts of your answer were, um, yeah, were so are so appreciated. And and hearing about, um, I mean, both of the things you're you're following your your inclination to be curious, looking under the sink at pipes, and and that just continues to build on on what you're doing now, and and shows how important it is that children are allowed to play and experiment and and look around at stuff. So um, yeah, thank you, and and so then. Um, yeah, this is great that you followed the path of superfluids. And then can you carry us up into your current research, how you ended up here? Yeah, so, uh, well, <clears throat> as I explained, I, I became a superfluid scientist by selecting a group that was working on superfluids, more or less by well, semi-accident, if you wish. Um, but as soon as I was in there, I was so fascinated about about the combination of you know the variety of everything that was involved from from practical aspects like soldering things and building pipe work and and um, uh, like real hands-on experiments to the very complicated theoretical aspects which have to do with with helium three especially um, 
and the people doing doing like uh, or sharing their expertise in that. I mean, I'm I'm an experimentalist, but but I I do my best to understand something about the theories as well. Um, and so then, um, therefore, made, do, doing a PhD in in on this topic was kind of very obvious to me. And really, then after a PhD. Um, there is this tradition in Finland that you can't stay in the same university if you want to continue in, in academia. Um, and low temperature physics, especially ultra low temperature physics, which is, I guess, the most accurate subcategory, isn't really available in too many places, even in the, on the kind of international scale. Uh, so there's a handful of places in Europe, a couple of universities in the States, maybe three. Or, or potentially four, but certainly no more than five, and a few in Japan, uh, and that's basically it. I mean, there's certainly less than 20 groups worldwide. Um, and if you're looking for a postdoc position, well, then uh, this will be narrowed down, down quite a lot by the availability of suitable projects at that particular instant in time. So this is how I basically came to Lancaster. Um, and well, Lancaster has been has been a good place scientifically, and uh, recently I I won a fellowship for starting my own group here. So so uh, that seems to be the way things are rolling at the moment. They're rolling well. I was just curious because of your proximity to Manchester, if you were a Man U fan, but but we won't let that interfere with you um, discussing your your work. So. So at this point, thank you so much for, for carrying us along through that, through your path. And you are welcome to deliver your talk now. And if you would prefer to have a Q&A at the end, um, then, then that's great. And if you'd prefer to have questioning along the way to drive your discussion, then, then that's entirely up to you. And your, your um, PDF is pinned at the top so people may follow along. So um, I need to um, hop out of this talk for a while, but I want to thank you so much. And the mic is yours. OK, thank you very much. Um, well, please do ask questions while I'm talking, if that is somehow conveniently possible. Uh, but if you don't, I will just keep going uh, through, through this presentation, and, and we can discuss what, whatever you wish um, at the end of it. All right, thank you so much. Yep. Um, well, you're not going to need the, the slides at the very beginning, but later on when I talk about the um, experimental machinery and, and how things actually look like in practice, then, then you may, may want to have the PDF available for yourself. Um, because in the first slide I've just got some photos and some, some notes for myself to, to, to remember what I should, what, what, what I should talk about. Um, <clears throat> right, so the um, one possible place to start a history of time crystals is about a century ago. Um, excuse me. It's about a century ago uh, with uh, a Russian scientist called Lev Landau. And uh, Landau with some, some co-workers came up with the idea that, that phase transitions, so transitions from, for example, a liquid to a solid phase of a certain, ma certain material like water, that these phase transitions are conveniently understood in terms of uh, the symmetries that are broken in the transition or at the transition moment. Now, uh, this is, at, at, at heart, this is a very technical, a very mathematical, uh, way of seeing things. Well, the basic idea is to look at um, is to look at the uh, well in in the case of, of liquids and solids to look at the characterizing difference between the two and to come up with the simplest mathematical way of describing that. And so, that in the case of a liquid to solid transition, uh, what happens is we can we can take the liquid and look at point A, then we can 
moves in any random direction and look at point B, and the liquid lo will look exactly the same. When the liquid solidifies, um, this will cease to be the case. And so then we're going to have to move by a certain distance or a certain or, or a multiple of this distance. And the distance is known as the lattice constant. So it's the distance between the atoms in this systematic structure that forms the solids. And so this is um, the transition from one of these to the other one is, is, is called symmetry breaking because uh, the symmetry of uh, being able to continuously move around and nothing changes so you have to move by discrete steps uh, is mathematically called symmetry breaking. And it has to be spontaneous in the sense that, that there is no external enforcement, so we're not placing the atoms in some sort of rigid grid, they just want to organize themselves in this way, uh, in very layman terms. Technically speaking, this means that the uh, expression for the energy of the system does, does not contain anything that, is, that intrinsically favors uh, such a structure. Well then, in 2012, so about a century later, Frank Wilczek um, was applying this idea and uh, in my mind what he was doing was he was looking at a catalogue of, of known symmetry breakings in, in, in uh, like experimentally explored phase transitions, which is pretty complete. So almost everything that you can imagine um, is also realized in some natural or laboratory system. But one is not, or it wasn't at that time, and that is time translation symmetry. So we, well, what this means is that, that um, if we look at a, a collection of matter in a, um, which um, is organized in a certain way at, mo at, at moment A in time, then it will look exactly the same, assuming it's in it, it's in some sort of ground state, so like lowest energy state. It will look the same at any given moment uh, later on. Uh, in other words, similar spontaneous breaking of this translation symmetry wasn't known in any system. And he was asking the question whether it would be possible to come up or construct a system where this translation symmetry is broken. And he called that a time crystal with, in a mathematical reference to space crystals, so ordinary, ordinary uh, uh, crystalline solids, where the same thing happens in, in, in space instead of time. Okay, so that's uh, so much about where the idea came from. Well, very, very quickly it was then realized that, uh, that what he has described, so basically, a phase of matter where particles keep moving synchronously and periodically without external enforcement, it was very quickly realized that this actually makes a perpetual motion machine um, in layman terms again. So, uh, and, and that should tell you that it's uh, impossible to, to make a system like this. Um, well, and well, I mean that, that's a, a curious coincidence, <coughs> considering that uh, what the research publication that this presentation will end up with uh, concerns experimental studies of uh, time crystals. Um, and theoretically speaking, the excuse that well, one excuse we can use is that quantum physics is weird, so it's actually okay. If things keep moving forever in some certain period, uh, or with some certain period, as long as we can't see it, and so if we if we go and observe it, uh, so meaning we create a measurement that that is uh, coupled to this motion, then the motion should should start leaking energy and will eventually disappear. Um, right. Then, from an experimental point of view, uh, this, putting the same, uh, or that there's another excuse we can use, which is that um, the mathematical structure of physics is so strong in many, in many, many cases that we can actually afford to only kind of approximately fulfill the conditions 
for a certain, uh, well, in this case, new phase of matter. And things will still work reliably. And in a combination of these two, then we can experimentally create time crystals. Um, and while you could argue that uh, that then this is kind of trickery and why why do you bother? Uh, it actually turns out that um, this is a theoretically a powerful approach, and it will allow us to ask things like whether we can melt time crystals, which I will return to. But of course, there's a certain aspect of you know a good sci-fi name doesn't hurt when it comes to to gathering attention and getting your things published. So I mean that, that's a factor which 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 is there uh, un undoubtedly. Right. Well, I'm now moving on to page two in the in the PDF where I will have some where I have some experimental figures uh, of the of the machinery if uh, if you wish to follow uh, that, that document. Okay. So um, shifting gears a bit, I'm now going to talk about how do we actually do this in practice. So, so the system we are using uh, to create time crystals. The underlying system is, is, is called superfluid helium-3. Um, helium-3 is a rare version of helium with, uh, with only one neutron, whereas helium-4 with two neutrons is the stuff that you put in, put in balloons and so on. Um, and, uh, well, for our purposes, helium-3 is... Um, is much more interesting because it turns out it will have intrinsic structure that, as an example, will allow creating time crystals inside the superfluid. But it has the downside that uh, that you need to cool it down to uh, ridiculously low temperatures before it turns into this superfluid that is that is a prerequisite of, of what we want to create. Uh, namely, we need to get it down to at least a, a thousand of a degree from absolute zero, and we'd prefer to be close to a ten thousandth of a degree from absolute zero. Uh, and that's not very easy, can be done. And what we'd use for that is, is shown in the figure on the, on, in the picture on the right. So this is, um, this is a nuclear demagnetization cryostat. Uh, there are maybe 20 of these things of different varieties uh, in the world. Um, and well, it's unrelated to the project I'm not talking about, but this one is actually rotating. So you can see that this whole thing is spinning around its its axis in this photo, um, and it turns about half a turn per per second uh, in this in this photo. Um, uh, just as a kind of a funny technical curiosity. And while it's doing all that, it cools our superfluid to about 100 microkelvins. Um, and how we do that is shown on the left. So this is the inside of, uh, of the cryostat. What is the part which is shown is inside the blue vessel in the right photo, which is a, uh, a thermos container for liquid helium-4. So this whole, the, the whole thing on the left is immersed in liquid helium-4, and, and so that is um, a liquid which boils at four, four and a half Kelvin, four and a half degrees above absolute zero. And that's kind of the starting temperature of, um, of the cool down process. After that, uh, which you can't see in this photo, there's a, a container inside the bit, um, there is the um, horizontal steel colored bit at like the one fifth from the down from the top above the label which says steel chamber or the arrow which points to the steel chamber. Um, and so this all, all that then from down from there will be covered by a vacuum can. So this is a steel can which isolates, which allows us to pump the inside to, to a vacuum. And then there's a sequence of cool down stages. Uh, first of which is known as the 1K pot. So this is a chamber where you use a powerful vacuum pump to, to force helium-4 to evaporate. And so to keep, well, if we keep the pressure down, then the temperature in this chamber goes to about one and a half Kelvin or something like that. 
Um, and then the, the rest of the machine between the steel chamber, uh, which is well, its long name is distillation chamber. I'll come back to that in a minute. And what's known as the mixing chamber uh, operates using a funny phenomenon, which is that if you take helium-4 and helium-3, so these two stable isotopes of helium, and you mix them, you force them to be mixed, which happens in the mixing chamber, then this mixing process will, will decrease the temperature of the mixture without any lower bound for, this, for the operation of this process in temperature. And to facilitate this mixing process, there is a distillation chamber where we pump helium-3 out from the, segment, from, from the system. And the two chambers are connected via a capillary tube. And then there is another tube which feeds helium-3 in. And so what the outcome of this is that we, fit, we mix the two in the mixing chamber and we separate them in the steel chamber. And the steel chamber goes to like half a Kelvin and the mixing chamber goes to maybe five millikelvin or something like that. So uh, five thousandths of a degree from absolute zero. So that's not enough. And after that, what we do is uh, we take a large chunk of copper, high purity copper, which is called the nuclear stage, uh, which here is covered by a brass shield, so you can't see the copper actually. And then we put that in a very high magnetic field, let's say in the 7 tesla or 8 tesla magnetic field. Um, and uh, the copper then is cooled down by the mixing chamber until we close this connection or remove the connection. And then we ramp the magnetic field down. And the outcome is that the nuclei in the copper cool down as proportional to the changes in the magnetic field. So if they start from a few millikelvin, they can easily go to a few tens of microkelvin uh, at the end of the process. And if we connect this to the superfluid sample, then we can cool the superfluid uh, to maybe 100 microkelvin. And so this is, this is how we get the experiment uh, facilitated. Well, if we move on to P in the PDF file, you will see what the experiment itself looks like. Um, so on the right, there is a photo of, uh, of, the, of the real experiment. So um, in the middle, you can see this uh, 15 centimeter long glass tube. Uh, it's quartz glass, which is about six millimeters uh, in diameter. And that is where the superfluid goes. So we, this is filled with liquid helium-3, um, and then it is connected to the nuclear stage at the bottom of this figure via some uh, powdered silver surface, which it has an enormous surface area for the purpose of maximizing the uh, thermal conductivity between the two systems. Okay, so that was somewhat technical, but, but I, I think it was probably entertaining to, to most of the audience. <clears throat> this brings us to where the experiment itself starts. Um, so on the left, you can see um, a uh, Povre uh, representation of, uh, of this same glass tube where uh, the coils that are used for, the for facilitating the experiments uh, are also shown. So these have been removed from, from the photo on the right. And then uh, without going to too much detail about what's going on here, um, we organize a trapping potential, so basically um, a spatial arrangement for two time crystals to be placed in by a combination, combined effect of, of tuning the magnetic field profile and, and moving um, the surface of the superfluid uh, to a suitable location inside the tube. And then um, the time crystals themselves, they are made from magnetic quasi particles. Um, so these are essentially um, uh, the intrinsic excitations of the superfluid, and they're called quasi particles 
for the reason that they behave like particles, but you can't take them outside the superfluid. So therefore they're not particles without the quasi, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but otherwise the difference of these things and particles for the purposes of our experiment are uh, non-existent. <clears throat> okay, and these particles, they are, uh, they correspond to, uh, if you want, their quanta of spin waves in, in, the, in the liquid, which means that, that they are um, basically little magnet, magnets which are spinning, and because they are doing that, you can then, uh, you can then couple to them, so you can observe this motion by bringing in uh, coils made from copper wire, which are shown these brown NMR coil things in the on the in the picture on the on the on the left. And what will basically happen is that the magnetic field will be constantly changing, and this will um, create a voltage in the coils. And then we we bring wires out of the cryostat, um, and we put this 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 voltage into a recording device, and then it appears on the computer monitor as as a sine wave. Well, in reality, there's a, a very complicated system for uh, removing noise and amplifying the signal and uh, isolating everything from the from the environment and and uh, some resonator circuits for in, for again amplifying the signal and some locking amplifiers for removing certain frequencies and and various other things that you probably don't want to know about. Uh, but but that's basically what is done. Um, and then. The little magnetic quasi particles, these magnons, they um, to use one one theoretical tool or language, they form a Bose-Einstein condensate, um, which means that they are quantum things do all doing the same thing. So they are all spinning the same way at the same speed and um, uh, within one BEC. And <coughs> um, and because they are moving this way, and because they are moving uh, periodically, although the system doesn't contain any hint as to what this period should be, then this also makes a spontaneously moving periodic system that one can observe. So therefore it is, experimentally speaking, a time crystal. Um, what we do here is we couple the system kind of weakly, so the lifetime of it will be relatively long for quantum stuff, so it can be, well, you can push it to half an hour, but, but more typically it would be maybe 10 minutes or 5 minutes or something like that. Which is extremely long, considering that that uh, most quantum systems, even the ones where people actually want to, to extend their the lifetimes, the coherence times, as much as possible, would, would be dying out much faster, I mean, orders of magnitude faster. Um, okay, so we've got time crystals, and we can we know how to observe them, and well, the basic methods to to create them have been have been explained as well as the theoretical motivation. Well, what did we actually do then in in this research work? Well, if we move to page four, so the last page in this PDF file, uh, there are some examples of uh, of the measurement data and analysis from the paper itself. Now, I will not discuss uh, much of the, of the mathematics or the analysis or the technical conclusions we draw, uh, but I will kind of, in, in some sort of overview, I will try to explain uh, what's going on and why we, why we believe this is um, um, what it is and why it is relevant before then trying to, to kind of explain uh, uh, in a, some sort of broader context what, what the conclusions may be. Right, so um, a time crystal can exist as long as it is not interacting with anything, uh, which is to say as long as we are not observing it. And if we start observing it, it should start disappearing. So then we can ask the question, if we take two time crystals and make them quotes observe one another, then doesn't it mean that they must also start disappearing? Um, well, it turns out it doesn't mean that. And 
it can also be done in practice, and that's exactly what we have done here. So we took two time crystals that were actually shown in the previous uh, slides or in this in this uh, 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 computer rendered picture. And we took these two time crystals and we made them touch one another. And if you make two quantum quantum objects touch one another, then then there are certain very specific predictions from uh, from the machinery of quantum mechanics that tell you what you, what you should expect to happen. Um, and uh, one of them is that um, that if there are two systems, they will form a so-called two-level system. Not a very creative name, but what it means is that that um, you get this like um, phenomenology and toolbox of this this kind of Hamiltonian, if you wish, which will which will make certain predictions. For example, if you try to make the energies of the frequencies of the of the two constituent levels cross, then the the stuff that you can observe will uh, just avoid crossing and <clears throat> and this picture which you can see here if you analyze it carefully I mean uh, so what we're looking at here is uh, is a basically a frequency decomposition of the of the measured signal from the from the coils this is the top right figure in the last slide and so we see these these colored peaks which are moving in time so those are the two the bulk and the surface uh, time crystals, if you wish, and the observed frequency of the lower frequency state continuously uh, moves, and uh, there's no obvious crossing with the with the higher frequency. And then, with some complicated analysis of the of the frequencies and couplings, and there is other things which you, which are shown in the analysis plot on the on the left lower corner. Uh, we can indeed confirm that they didn't cross and that everything works the way expected. For example, that particles are moving between the two, two states, which are, are seen as this, what is labeled as the sideband in this in this plot. Okay, well, I could keep talking about the, the contents of the paper for a long time, but I think I won't do that. If, if, you, if you want to learn more, I, you, can, you can ask me after I've, I've, I've finished this uh, introduction. <coughs> I thank you so much for for this really um, interesting introduction and how you set up the experiments um, to create these time crystals. That's really interesting. I, I um, yeah. Um, so thank you so much for that. And um, yeah, if you open for questions, uh, please flash your microphones uh, once you know you have a question, <laughs> Jamie. I know you were waiting, so please go ahead. <laughs> Hi, uh, uh, Dr. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, it's a wee bit mind blowing, and there's a there's a lot of stuff that I don't really get. But one question I do have: when you were describing before how you get the temperature uh, as low as you were talking about, yes, um, I was trying to get my head around that. Um, when you were talking about adding the um, the, was it helium four with the helium three, yeah. Yes. Um, is this will sound so dumb, but is this a little bit like how when you put ice into water, it makes the water colder? Uh, I mean, obviously not the same in terms of like anything like you know, but, um, um, well, you're trying to put, uh, well, you it's, it's not very far from that, um, in that it is indeed a, if you wish, a thermodynamic process which follows the mixing, and the outcome of the thermodynamic process is the temperature drops. Um, and so if you want a uh, uh, kind of a relevant uh, um, back of the envelope picture of how this works, basically um, helium-4 is doing nothing <clears throat> because this temperature is very low for helium-4 uh, helium already. And so what, me what this means is that we, when we bring helium-3 in, it will expand into the space which is essentially emptiness. And then if we expand a gas into a con larger container, it always cools down. 
So this is what what the helium three why it, it ends up cooling down the system in, in kind of semi classical uh, teaching. Of course, the quantum mechanical picture is a bit more involved, but but it's not very far from this hand waving idea. Really, is that the idea um, of? Um... Is it like, uh, I think I remember something like it, heat itself is just the vibration of atoms or something. So when you talk about filling in the spaces, are you talking about filling in the spaces so much that they, there's even less movement for them, so there's even less heat? Or am I completely misunderstanding? Well, you don't need to go to quantum physics or any Brownian notion. You can just think about um, the kind of simple-minded uh, large-scale observation that if I have gas in a small tank, and then a valve, and then a big tank, and I open the valve so that the gas from the small tank goes to the empty large tank, then, then what happens is that the gas gets colder. And that's just the way thermodynamics of ideal gases works. Um, and so that's, um, that's not very far from how why helium three cools down when you expand it into a volume of helium four, um, although that sounds kind of wild. That that does that. Honestly, I'm finding it difficult to get my head around. <laughs> that does sound quite wild. Thank you. Uh, Gilbert, did you have a question you were unmiked or? Was it and um, Dr. Shah? Yep, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, we cannot hear you, Gilbert. Um, I'm not sure. Do you, can anyone? Is it on my side or? We can hear you fine. Can no, I can't hear. Okay. Um, Dr. Shah, did you have a question? Or Katie? I have another one if no one else does. Okay, yeah, then I'll go after after you. And and then George also joined the stage. Okay, go ahead, Jim. Um, okay, here I am again. Um, so I was having a look at your paper um, and there was a, a part, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit, please. It was the part about the uh, the two time crystals interact with non-linear feedback? Yes. Um, I don't understand uh, much of that at all, but um, could you explain what, like, what linear feedback is for me, please, and maybe what non-linear then would be would make more sense to me, please? Okay. <clears throat> all right. Um... Right, so um, usually a two-level system, so the simplest two-body quantum system that you can have, doesn't have any feedback, uh, which is to say you externally set the parameters of the system and then the evolution follows from that. Um, you may be changing them in time, but, uh, but re regardless, they are somehow externally determined. Then you can have linear feedback, which means that um, the, the changes imposed depend on what are happening in the system rather than on what the experimental, uh, experimentalist uh, is, is how he's turning the knobs in the lab. But, uh, but, but this linear means that the effect is always proportional to the cause. And then nonlinear feedback is the same, but the connection to the course is um, is not all. It doesn't have to be proportional to what is causing it. So it's just more complicated, and so therefore results in a richer uh, potential set of physical phenomena, if you wish. Um, and so in the case of this, this experiment, the feedback means that that. Um, um, in all the all the uh, experimental figures where you see that, say for example, the frequencies of um, of the things observed are changing, they are changing because the frequencies depend on the population of the time crystals, and 
this is a kind of a complicated feedback mechanism which has to do with how the superfluid underneath everything all, all of this is behaving um, and so therefore we basically what we do is we uh, we put a certain number of magnons to both the states and then 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 it's hands off from that moment so then everything is happening just because of the intrinsic logic of the system if that's basically what the nonlinear feedback means Wow, that's actually quite incredible. <laughs> that's, well, thank you so much for answering that. Yeah, um, thank you so much again. And um, I wanted to ask, so, <clears throat> so I read that um, you can, since you link two time crystals together, it would um, maybe open up for the future um, a way to um, use this for quantum computing. How how does it? Because you know we we learned on a talk we had here before and from you that you cannot really like time crystals um, oscillate work while um, we basically don't um, don't disturb them. Right? We have to isolate them and as long as they don't produce any work, uh, it kind of works. Um, but did that change since you linked the two together and will it open up a possibility for using this, um, yeah, the system for quantum computing? Yeah, so um, well, there are different aspects to the, to the answer to that. Um, one of them is that uh, on a kind of general conceptual and capability sort of level and even maybe theoretical understanding the problem of um, observing the, and, and not observing a time crystal is, is very closely related to the problem which you face in like mo one of the most common problems which you face in or challenges which you face in building a, a quantum computer which is how do you uh, control the system when you want to control it, but uh, avoid disturbing it otherwise. Um, and so in this sense, from kind of a technological perspective, learning how to do one will also tell us how maybe the other one can be done. And this is actually reflected in, in uh, recent developments in time crystals, because some of the most recent works have been done using what you might call prototype time, uh, uh, sorry, um, quantum computers or systems that people study for uh, eventually the aim of, of creating a quantum computer. Um, and then if we go to technical detail, well, maybe a time crystal could be used as a memory because it lives so long or, um, or something else. But that, that's really kind of like very far-fetching speculation. Um, <clears throat> and it would be, I mean, for a blue skies researcher like myself, it would be much more natural to try to, if we have to speculate, to, to speculate about uh, what may be the fundamental consequences eventually, or if, if, you're, if you're allowed to dream, then what would you dream about, uh, what would be the consequences of the research eventually. And so here, one potential answer, which uh, I actually forgot to talk about during the introduction on this first part, is that um, um, so um, there are really big problems in 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 modern physics, which uh, which remain to be solved. And one of the most famous ones is that um, we don't know how you continuously get from quantum physics, which describes small systems, to classical physics, which describes the everyday experience. The continuum between the two worlds uh, is kind of conceptually uh, incompatible. And well, these kind of these large quantum systems, of which time crystals are one example, sit between the two worlds in uh, many different ways. And so, therefore, they allow studying the interface between these two things. And so, maybe by studying time crystals, then eventually 
as an example, if we if we uh, if we learn how to melt a time crystal, then it takes us uh, one step closer to classical physics from from uh, from this uh, kind of coherent or sy uh, synchronized time crystal world. And so maybe then by doing this consistently, we can we can learn how how the uh, classical and quantum actually join up in the middle somewhere. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, um, and by so you, you have to kind of um, keep the system really isolated, um, if I'm correct. So, um, yes. so are you so, so if, if you add, if you let uh, leak some some type of little interaction like how fast does it disrupt or does it continue going do the oscillations continue going on for a little bit or does it depend of the factor or does any uh, leak basically of interaction um, you know immediately disrupts um, this oscillation uh, well that that depends on how you organize things, but the way they are organized in the current experiment, each time crystal contains a large number of particles, which is to say it can leak for a long time before it, dis it completely disappears. And indeed, the experiments we do, uh, we actually continuously record what, what the time crystals are doing, so that's why you see these continuous traces in time in the paper. In this, uh, well, technically, these are windowed Fourier transforms, but, but basically, they are these things where where time crystal shows us a frequency peak in time in these color maps, um, and that means so, and and, and well, that's basically because um, the coils we use for observing the time crystal are there all the time. In principle, it would be totally possible to take the coils out uh, for a while and then bring them back mechanically when we want to check what's going on and in, in, in um, assuming uh, we'd at the same time make the system very cold I mean as cold as it can be made basically then um, then there would be hardly any leakage uh, if, at, if, if any uh, I think the longest longest lifetimes that have been observed were close to half an hour or even exceeding that um, and that it was still with some small coils in place as I'm pretty sure um, so in principle if we take the coils out I mean if you put your hands in and remove the coils then the system is basically living forever uh, from the perspective of how fast other things are happening in this system yeah I have one more question that um I asked uh, Dr. Pedro before, but you know, since you since you go to this blue sky thinking um, to make assumptions, um, you know, from the quantum to the macroscopic world, um, like my my thinking was that if time crystals make this connection. Would you um, so would this support the hypothesis that we don't have like one big bang, but more like a bouncing back? That like our universe oscillates, uh, keeps oscillating if it is an isolated system. Uh, I know that's really far fetched, but I you know I like thinking about these far fetched ideas. Uh, I don't think it has anything to do with that, but uh, I could be wrong. Um, yeah, so uh, the um, I mean, if in in slightly more theoretical terms, um, um, as I said in the very big beginning, we have good reasons to believe that time time crystals, in the strict sense of something which moves forever and which you can still go and see, cannot be created and will never exist. Uh, and so, in this sense, uh, it's kind of a physicist's adventure to 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 um, 
a laboratory experiment which goes close to some interesting theoretical concept but uh, but you should keep in mind that that um, it's done for the benefit of our understanding of physics accepting that that this necessitates certain compromise about about uh, uh, what you can actually do in in like general reality um, and then when it comes to stretching everything to cosmology um, well there are there are multiple multiple obstacles conceptually between quantum physics and and cosmology for example general relativity is not compatible with quantum physics either i mean let alone classical physics uh, with quantum physics and so so this means that making predictions in the region uh, of the history of the universe where both of these are uh, simultaneously needed is not something that we can currently even like discuss because we know that so to to, to basically to explain <coughs> to describe large gravity the high density of mass if you wish um, which is a, a, definitely the case in in the in the region close to the big bang uh, or even relatively far after it and then um, um, bringing that together with with um, uh, quantum physics which is also definitely the case not only in the big bang but also for, for example at the surface of a, of a black hole which is kind of much less exotic than the big bang from the present day perspective uh, that this this is not something that can be actually done uh, reliably and and um, and if you start digging there will be contradictions and that basically tells you that that uh, one should be very careful so so um, whether the universe repeats itself while it is i don't think it's related to time crystals is an, a very interesting question but unfortunately uh, current theories are fairly unable to speculate speculate about that on any kind of level of credibility okay yeah my thinking was that you have basically a microscopic system based on you know um like um that the behaving in a quantum way that it would be an oversimplified model basically of uh what on a large scale happens <laughs> like you know we always go back to very simple models like yes a squid for a human brain <laughs> and yes. stuff like that it was oversimplified but yeah thank you for explaining i appreciate that i see um that Ashkat and Dr. Shah, you didn't ask a question. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, Dr. Sam. Uh, and it was a great presentation and, uh, you know, really appreciate your time here. Uh, just have two uh, very simple questions because, you know, as my background, I'm not into theoretical physics as much. But I just wanted to, my first question is, uh, you had mentioned about the coils the uh, smr nm uh, this was the nmr coils and you had explained that um, because of the use of these nmr coils you were able to capture the analog signals and you were able to gauge the you know the sine wave uh, that was uh, that was basically projecting on your computational uh, devices and you had also explained that uh, you were using certain kinds of noise reduction uh, techniques and other aspects to you know uh, make it more comprehensible so i just wanted to ask while you were uh, doing this uh, did you uh, what kind of what kind of uh, findings were you getting without all those um, you know noise attenuating uh, devices that you included so as to get capture the comprehensible uh, frequencies so what kind of observations were you facing without the you know attenuation devices and snr reductions um right um well i guess i would start the answer from from um the fact that uh, 
a cryogenic experiment like this takes a very long time pre to prepare. And so therefore, if you want to change something, I mean, as an example, you cool down the system, you change something, you know, hands-on, and then you put everything back in place and start to cool down, and it's going to take you about a month before the experiment will, will, will be ready to start. And you're going to have, you will have, you know, used, I don't know, 10,000 pounds of, of electricity to run the system. So it's, uh, it's not something that you do uh, very often if you can avoid it. And with this background, we, we never really measured or even tried to measure uh, the signals without sophisticated signal handling technology for the simple reason that, that they are very small and you wouldn't really see much. Um, However, all the individual components can be uh, can be tested on their own, and we know exactly what they do with like trivial input. Um, and also, we can turn off the uh, the physics in the system by, for example, emptying the sample container completely, and then measuring what the amplifiers do on their own to an input signal. And so we are, in this way, it's kind of um, very straightforward to, to understand what, uh, what the circuitry contribution is. And so we're very confident that, that the, what the measurement uh, yields in the end is, is just the real physics and nothing but the real physics. Um, to, to give you an idea of, of the kind of components which go in, um, we start from the closest bit to the experiment. Uh, well, it's going to be slightly technical, but but um, but so you've got these coils, and then um, they have inductors, which means that it takes a certain amount of energy to create a magnetic field using these coils. And then, if you connect them, the wire that goes to the coils to a capacitor, um, which is an electric component then uh, this combination will have a resonance frequency. So a frequency at which it will effortlessly oscillate if you want. And, and this can be used to amplify the readout from the coils because um, the resonator will um, uh, kind of be more willing to accept that frequency than any other frequency. So any, any phenomena at that frequency will be very visible while all other things will be will be kind of suppressed, and which is very handy. Then there are, after that, then, then there are lots of um, uh, very annoying and very tedious uh, components, some of which are in the, the cold bits of the thing and are made in the lab for this particular purpose. And it took some poor PhD student uh, probably a few years to, to create them. Um, which are all needed to, to make the signal large enough, not because we can't measure small voltages, but because inevitably the environment will be radiating noise into everywhere, everywhere and so then this noise will be just simply larger than what you're trying to measure if, if you don't do all these things before that. All right, all right. Thank you very much for that explanation. <clears throat> my second, my second uh, question is, uh, you have used helium three and helium four uh, in order to uh, uh, you know observe the super uh, the time crystal and its behavior uh, in the future what other uh, material or what other uh, types of uh, elements uh, you think you know would be best suited for a similar kind of uh, experiment and uh, you know how much do you have uh, like you may not have conducted the experiment yet, but what kind of, uh, um, you know, idea or belief do you have that it may uh, take part with the similar kind of uh, setup and the experiment? Oh, that's an, that's an interesting question. Um, well, first of all, from the te technology perspective, um, the cool down methods which we which we uh, acutely need to carry out any of these experiments are highly dependent on various material prop like properties 
of not only helium-3 and helium-4, but also many of the metals and plastics which are used for various purposes in the construction. And um, usually these materials are more or less irreplaceable. So, for example, the cool-down process it can hardly be done with any other uh, elements uh, other than helium-3 and helium-4. Um, and um, so that's for the continuous cool down stage, and and then uh, I don't know um, the metals which are used for building the cryostat, are things like copper and gold and silver and and a few other things. They um, they are very carefully selected and they are used in a very carefully selected sequence, and that cannot be changed either without losing some of the performance. So so that, that's unlikely to change. Um, then when it comes to the sample itself and, and the physics, um, well, helium-4, first of all, is as, used just as a workhorse, so it never enters the, it, well, in this experiment, it doesn't enter the, 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 the sample container itself. Uh, it is just, just for, for cooling things down. And, and when it comes to helium-3, well, that's actually one of my favorite topics. So, so helium-3 is a very unique... Uh, physical system. And while the reasons why this is the case are a bit convoluted, um, and I can explain that, but, but it will take me a moment, um, the, uh, the consequences are easy to explain. But this system has, has um, it's a quantum system with, with um, a very rich internal structure. And the consequence of that is that it is um, conceptually and mathematically connected to seemingly very distant fields in physics, such as cosmology and and high energy physics, particle physics. Uh, for example, um, the Higgs mechanism, which everybody has heard of, was originally actually a superfluid idea, and it was known as the Anderson mechanism before Higgs, Peter Higgs and fellows uh, applied it to the standard model, and well, that's what it is now known for these days. Um, and so, um, with all that, it's uh, for this particular kind of research, there are very few alternatives, and so therefore it's unlikely that I will switch to any other uh, any other kind of physical system anytime soon. Because, well, and also because I do do this very well and don't know much about other things. But but I mean that's a kind of a practical reason. Um, maybe I could try to explain why this diversity appears. Although I'm not sure I'd be able to do this in a comprehensible way. But but. Um, um, so when you form a macroscopic quantum system, you're going to need a, a phenomenon called condensation in general terms, which means that all the atoms, all the particles that make your system need to be in a single quantum state and doing the same stuff. Um, and then nature knows two different types of particles. There are bosons and there are fermions. Um, and well, this is one of the weird consequences of quantum mechanics. And so bosons can readily, readily all be in the same state, but fermions simply cannot. So if you try to make fermions go to the same state, then uh, quantum mechanics will tell you that this, this cannot happen. And even three is a fermion. Um, so in order to turn that into a superfluid, something extraordinary needs to happen first. And this weird thing is, is uh, pairing up of the atoms. So another peculiarity of quantum mechanics is that if you pair up fermions, then they become bosons together. Um, and while pairing up certain things like electrons in superconductors is straightforward because electrons don't occupy any space, uh, they point like particles, if you wish. Um, 
uh, pairing up helium-3 atoms is not easy because I mean, they have actually a size. The atom has, has hardcore repulsion with other similar atoms if you try to push them very close to one another. And then via some theoretical detours, this ends up meaning that the pairing state becomes very complicated. So the way you form these pairs is very complicated. And this very complicated implies that the quantum mechanics of the outcome of the resulting system um, basically contains just about all the physics, theoretically speaking, that, that there is. I mean, that's a slight exaggeration, but not much. Um, and which makes helium-3 a very interesting topic to study because um, suddenly when, you, when you're carrying out an experiment it may actually be telling you something about cosmology instead. Interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sam. And it was, you know, uh, a small little masterclass that you've given and, you know, many thanks on that. Yep, thank you. That, that actually is truly mind-blowing. Um, I have another uh, question for you, and I'm sorry if this sounds too uh, too simple, but um, I saw that when in the paper when you were talking about um, the two, like linking up, coupling up the two uh, time crystals, you could extend the, the life of the observational life up to is that a thousand seconds, um, I think you said in here. Um, uh, what is it happens that why why only a thousand seconds? Is it because it gets too warm? The heat it heats up too much, or what's the reason um, for that? Right. Uh, well, where should I start? Um, well, I guess um, I guess when when a physicist reads a thousand seconds in the, in the quantum context, I mean, and, and especially for a coherence time, which this basically is. Then um, you know that's. I mean, typically you would be reading about milliseconds or something like that. So, the, so this is a very long time. Um, uh, why it is not infinity? Uh, uh, there are no two known reasons, and maybe new reasons would appear if we pushed it far beyond what we have done so far. But two known reasons, and they are the following. Um, the, the uh, measurement apparatus around the system will, uh, due to the way, well, fundamentally because of, uh, of quantum, how quantum physics works, if you're observing the system then in this way, then, then energy will go out. Well, I mean, we can obviously, we could speculate about removing the observation, and that's, technically speaking, not difficult uh, in principle at least to imagine how this would happen. And so then we just have the quasi-particles, these magnons in the superfluid, and everything else is very far away. So this leaves an intrinsic mechanism for the, the removal of magnons, if you like. Um, and that has to do with thermal excitations of the superfluid itself, and basically well, if you like, collisions with these thermal excitations, which are a different type of a quasi-particle. Um, and this will be suppressed exponentially. Uh, this is the technical term, so very rapidly, when temperature is decreasing. Meaning that if we decrease temperature from what it was in these experiments, we can we could easily uh, de suppress this effect by orders of magnitude within a certain not so not so wide range of temperatures. But uh, uh, inevitably, it's never going to be zero. Uh, however, it's kind of a similar vein as uh, as uh, accepting that some of the systems that you're studying to understand theory better may be just in experimental kind of reflection or realization of something which we can't really make in the lab, for example, time crystals, or even Bose-Einstein condensates, they are similar in this fashion. 
um, physicists tend to think that that uh, if something disappears exponentially, then in this in this region where it is very small, it is just as well to call it zero uh, for the for the purpose of understanding how it works. Um, and also theorists uh, will tell you if you ask them that uh, that zero doesn't exist. So I mean, there there is always coupling between everything. And it's only if it goes to zero very fast that you can, in practice, say that it doesn't exist. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. That's that's absolutely fascinating. Um, does anyone have more questions? I know we've been going for over an hour, um, so. Maybe we can ask one or two more questions to respect uh, Sam's time here. <laughs> Thank you for giving us, um, you know, all this time and answering all oh, this. My pleasure. <laughs> uh, Dr. Shah, anyone else? Yes, in the I, I mean, I want to say thank you so much. I was a little bit late at the beginning. So my question uh, from you is about um, we know that about the I mean, state of the energy, especially when we are talking about the time crystal, they are mostly in a lowest energy state. But however, they have a repetitive motion. And my question from you, because we know that they are not losing energy to the environment as well. Do we have any environment or, I mean, by today, that uh, somehow just break this, kind of behavior in the long term or not? I'm not sure I'm, I fully understood what you want or what you were asking, but, but let me try to answer anyway. Uh, I didn't go into detail about, about the theoretical complications around time crystals, but, but we can do it now because that would be a part of the answer. Um, so I said earlier that, uh, or referred to at least earlier, that the um, this kind of perpetual motion is okay in quantum physics if it cannot be observed. And indeed, there are systems where it never stops and it doesn't leak anything and we can't observe it. So, well, okay, you can ask whether it exists in any kind of reasonable sense, but, but if you take a, an ordinary, I don't know, superconductor, so, so a certain, I mean, this is a wide range of metals, for example, which become superconducting at a low enough temperature. Um, so if we do that, then this superconductor will be described by a large scale wave function, and a part of the wave function is a phase, this is basically the direction of the complex number that the wave function is, if you like, and in, in the complex plane. Um, and that direction will be rotating uh, forever. So, so this is perpetual motion, which doesn't leak anything that will never stop unless, well, unless the system warms up too much and the superconducting state is destroyed, therefore. But, uh, but we also have no hope of observing it. Uh, directly or indirectly. Um, and so um, this is why the the intuition of uh, of this this kind of uh, or the reference to the classic weirdness of quantum physics where where observations matter is actually so so useful because it, it really it turns out that that um, that you can do both. You can, you can have a system which doesn't decay and you can't see it, and you can do a system which does decay, but it will only slowly do it if you observe it kind of very carefully. I'm not sure whether that answered your question in any way. Yes, but. and so in this case, because you just explained, when we have two time crystals, do you still need that, uh, do that rotation? Because you just talked about rotation and changing the angle. Yes. So do, um, okay. 
yeah, well, that's that's an interesting question. Um, and the short answer is that that um, nothing changes if you bring in two time crystals. So the total number of magnons in them is not changing, is not decaying any faster because of the connection between them. Um, that's the short answer. The long answer is that, well, that we don't know how large uh, we can make the time crystals, or rather what kind of stuff we can connect to them before the decay process becomes a necessity. And this was this is a very technical way of uh, um, of saying that we do not know when quantum physics will turn into classical physics, um, because between quantum systems this kind of decay is not necessary, but between um, actual measurements, so human observations, and, and quantum systems, it is needed. Um, add many, many, many technical details around this, but, but this kind of the very rough outline of, of our current understanding of it. Um, yes, and this is this is an open problem. Nobody knows what the answer is. Um, uh, and in as a side note, um, one of the possible outcomes of quantum computer research, which is very well financed and many people are working on that, so there's a good reason to believe that something will come out of it. Uh, one potential and very interesting interesting outcome is that that they may find out uh, why quantum computing is not possible. So. So that's a, that's a possibility, and if they do, then it's very likely that this will tell us what happens at the interface between classical and quantum, which would be fantastic for, from the perspective of uh, fundamental physics, and maybe not so great for the companies investing in this, but, but uh, no, that's life. Uh, Dr. Sam, uh, I just wanted to, you know, I just ask one small thing and, you know, I'll just shut up. Uh, the thing is that you mentioned uh, in your experiment, uh, you had observed uh, that the time crystals have, uh, you know, periodic sinusoidal, uh, you know, uh, observations. So uh, was there any aspect of, uh, you know, quantum, quantum entanglement, uh, uh, the aspect of quantum entanglement that you could observe? Or do you feel that, you know, there was an aspect related in the experiment? Um, uh, well, the short answer is no, there is no quantum entanglement. Uh, but I will elaborate on that a bit. So generally speaking, another aspect of this, of this um, classical, the quantum uh, uh, question or set of questions is that these what we call macroscopic quantum systems, um, so large scale quantum systems made made from a large number of particles, they do not form entangled states, or at least forcing them to do so is extremely complicated. And so in this in this experiment that doesn't happen. Well then, then as a side note, I, I might say that that. Um, the Hamiltonian, so this mathematical description of uh, this two-level system that we study, is nevertheless a one-to-one -one, uh, kind of like um, uh, mappable, so corresponds one-to-one -to, -one to the description you would use for a small two-level system made from two atoms, for example, or whatever. Well, maybe not atoms, but uh, uh, states in a, let's say, a superconducting circuit. Um, and uh, that is including the superposition states that a small um, small system Hamiltonian describes. Um, and the superposition states in in a small system map to uh, states with different numbers of particles in this large system, mathematically speaking. Uh, but that does not mean that uh, that the large system, that in this large system, these uh, uh, states with different particle numbers 
would have um, any quantum character beyond the, that contained in the two-level Hamiltonian. For example, you cannot create, um, what shall I say, any of these weird long-range uh, effects that entangled states will come with, where if you measure one state, it has implications for the other one somewhere far away. That is not included. All right, all right, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for um, asking all these questions and um, thank you so much, um, Sam, for spending, um, you know, almost, yeah, an hour and a half with us and, and asking. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it um, and uh, this was so interesting. Um, it's, it's, you know, so far from, from what at least I do, uh, so it's, it's, you know, more fascinating for us, maybe, because you work uh, in this field every day. But for us, it's it's very fascinating. So well, I, mean, I have I, I I have to admit that you you do get used to the things. It's very slow, but you do get used to them. Uh, but um, but it doesn't mean that we are not kind of um, at least on a weekly basis very entertained by the by the outcomes anyway. So. So it's kind of a privilege to to be allowed to do physics in the lab. Oh, that's great! Yeah, um, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. I always some, you know, in between my job, I also feel like I get paid for my hobby. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, I'm really glad to hear that. So, people, please join physics and sciences. <laughs> you, yes. you, curious and, and figuring out problems if that's your thing uh, yeah go into sciences uh, I think currently you have a shortage of postdocs um, so uh, yeah if you go into the field you will get the job for sure the pay is not depending on where you live not not the best but you keep working on something that you're really intrigued by which is another thing not everyone gets to do <laughs> so well, I mean, it's, it's true that, that the pay is not like in you would get in some industry and well most obviously these times it would be a quantum computing where they will certainly pay you more but but um well at least on on the kind of best days then uh, the freedom which you get in exchange for that is is um uh, very unique, um, which is, I guess, one of the main motivations for people to stay in academia. Yeah, and you are allowed to publish, right? You're allowed to go to conferences in industry many times. You're not to do that. You're not yeah. allowed to talk about what you do. And uh, yeah, you don't travel as much uh, for work and uh, collaborate. So it's, it's, it's very different, I agree. It's, uh, yeah, so, um, well, thank you for sharing, and we yep. wish you a lot of funding, and <laughs> well, thank that, you. <laughs> that, uh, good luck for your own lab. You, you shared earlier that you're um, getting your own lab, probably, so uh, soon, so good luck yes. for that. Well, my own group, of course, the lab contains more people mm -hmm. than just me, but... Yes. Your own group, yeah, and that you get yeah. good people and <laughs> that everything works out. So, um, and yeah, thank you everyone for coming and asking questions. Oh, Kyle, he had, uh, I didn't, it didn't work to bring Kyle up. He had the question, but um, maybe Kyle, you can. Oh, he, he, is it? Yeah. Please share. <laughs> no, no, no worries. I just wanted to say thank you. I, I already put your next talk on the calendar. And um, just for fun, how many realities are there? Is there one ultimate objective reality? Um, or are there several multiple realities? Just for fun. <laughs> uh, 
I guess this is a, a reference to the interpretation problem of quantum physics. Um, um, what shall I say? I, I don't believe in the multiple multiple worlds interpretation. Um, that's kind of um, not an option for me. And uh, now that you mentioned that, uh, there is, um, I, I would say, relatively recent work uh, that is, I mean, experimental work which is relevant to this problem, which seems to indicate that also the, the famous Copenhagen interpretation, which basically says that you need to calculate and, and shut up and don't ask any stupid questions. Uh, that this interpretation is also wrong, but it's going to take me a lot of time to explain what that means, so maybe I will spare that for the uh, next time. Yeah, for those general questions, we had the guest speaker here um, a couple of months ago, um, where he, he works with protons and uh, inner protons, how they are entangled. Anyways, uh, he's also an experimental physicist, and uh, his experiments showed that um, the universe is most likely non-deterministic, which made me very happy. <laughs> Because I think that the thoughts of otherwise, um, yeah, if you're interested in these type of questions and talks, uh, check out our recordings and also join our discussions here. And yeah, thank you, Kyle, for asking that. It's, a, it's an interesting question. And thank you, Sam, for, um, yeah, for sharing your knowledge and your time with us. So we really appreciate yes, thank it. Thank you. Thank you very much for this talk, Sam. Uh, I know in the replays, I'll be picking through this for a long time to learn more and more each time. Thank you so, so much for this. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. And um, mad respect for your PTR, the captain hat. Love it. <laughs> well, that's actually a, um, a hat which you get when you go to a Finnish tech uni. Um, so the white stuff, the white hat you get from um, for uh, graduating uh, in in a high school, and then the tail piece, which you can see on the left, um, is added when you go to a tech a technology university. Okay, good to know. I I remember being in Porto, Portugal, and uh, saw a lot of people. I was like, oh wow, there are a lot of Harry Potter fans around here, but it was actually just the uh, uniform for school. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it looks sharp anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. It looks very cool. <laughs> Thank you for having that, PTR. And um, yeah, uh, uh, thank you again. Uh, if you like discussions like these, join the club, Science Society. We will have uh, two um, guest speaker events tomorrow. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. EST, we'll have Dr. Jill talking about his latest publication, um, Multi-Omic Rejuvenation of Human Cells. So it's uh, research about um, rejuvenation, uh, which is, uh, you know, quite interesting approach. And then we'll have at 9 p.m. EST, in the evening, joining us from Japan, Dr. Atas, um, model of a time machine to study ancestor galaxies life cycles so um it's um about you know how our universe was back in time and galaxies um in the earlier stages of the universe so um yeah thank you and thank you again sam uh, we really appreciate your time and i hope you come back one day Maybe with some yeah. update. All and right. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I dropped out for a sec. I'm sorry. <laughs> my app is freezing. Oh, my microphone. <laughs> It's constantly when I text in the back channel, keep, um, we ca I can't hear you, but maybe it's on my side.
Oh. Yeah, I, I, I don't know why. Whenever I press back and forth between, you know, looking at the Science Society to read out the, the program and all these different things, when I switch, it always asks me if I want to start a different room. Like, I don't know. That's so weird. Um, so apparently... Yeah, I, I couldn't do anything in between. So. Well, I tried to close the room again. I'm like, yes. Yeah. I think, Katarina, you're in the parallel universe right now. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, shall I close the room then for you? So you oh, yeah, if that works for you, thank you. Okay, you count and I'll close when you say Okay. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Three, two, one. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.